Hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. Welcome back to Realms Remembered. Sorry for that uh, somewhat long break there. You know how it is, life got in the way. Da -da 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 -da. Also working on a uh, not really top secret brand new project that should be coming up soon. Uh, those of you who were fans of Jason's and my uh, Civil War Acts of Treason podcast should be very excited. Those of you who could care less and are just interested in the Realms Remembered stuff will be annoyed because it's going to take some time away from me when I have time to work on these things. So sorry about that, but for the rest of you, I think it should be pretty exciting. Back to year 1368, Year of the Banner, the never-ending year. We're going to be on this for at least another podcast beyond this one. A vlogcast? I don't know. This isn't exactly a vlogcast because, like, there's no real video. It's just pictures of books. Whatever. So let's talk about the Lost Library of Cormanthir, which is probably not the right way to pronounce it because it's all elvish and crap. I... whatever, dude. You... Stick to your pronunciations, I'll stick to mine, whatever helps me read them faster, right? By Mel Odom. Odom, I can't pronounce anything. I sadly didn't like this book. I liked the fact, call me odd, but I really liked the fact that we had kind of a Disney movie animated animal sidekick. Like, I could not not picture the main character's animal sidekick as a little animated, like, Gilbert Gottfried voiced character. That was random, but I dug it. I, you know, I guess that's like a familiar, or a, not familiar, animal companion thing, but it just, it came across as a Disney character. I don't know, I read, I, I skimmed maybe the first hundred pages, like I only read like maybe t a couple of chapters, and then I just kind of skimmed, kept thinking, maybe once the Corman Theor plot actually enters into it, it'll be worthwhile, but it just, I, it didn't hook my interest. It seemed like maybe he was trying to do that kind of old school noir where the big question is, is she a villain or isn't she, and the main character's besotted, or does it go from there, but I don't know, it's been a while since I read it and it really didn't make much of an impression except the animated animal sidekick, so yeah. Lost Library of Cormanthir and Nether Scroll both have the same problem. They both suffer from the problem of their Lost Empires books, they're supposed to be about these things, like the Lost Library of Cormanthir is supposed to be about, uh, what is it, this elvish library, right? Whatever. And it's, it's really not. It's just basically, it's just another Realms book. Which is fine. If you want to do just another Realms book, it, it can be totally cool, but the Lost Empires thing seems a silly fit on it. I mean, obviously every book is going to have some sort of big, horrible thing, or some big, awesome treasure, possibly both, etc., etc. Putting that Lost Empires thing on there and making it seem like they're going to tell you more about the Empire really didn't work for me. Like, I think Shadowstone is practically more of a Lost Empires book than uh, either of these. Having said that, however, the Nether Scroll worked for me. I really enjoyed the Nether Scroll, which made me exceptionally happy because it's by Lynn Abbey, whose stuff I generally have not enjoyed. And I apologize, I didn't do the research. I kept meaning to find out if Lynn was a guy or a girl. I think it's a dude, but I could be totally wrong. In any case, Lynn Abbey stuff generally does not speak to me. Nether Scroll, for whatever reason, worked. It got a little weighty towards the end. Not weighty in the sense that it dealt with too many philosophical issues, but weighty in the sense that it was like somewhere around three quarters of the way through, I was like, okay, it should be done by now. But by then, I was invested enough in the characters that I kept going. It has a kind of a uh, Connor from Angel sort of character in it, and I think those characters are always somewhat frustrating, but that character does get better as he gets better developed through the story. First half is just kind of annoying, and it's like, come on, dude, seriously. But I think his character gets better and better as the series progresses along. This continues an odd sort of trend we're seeing of people liking to write really intelligent monsters. Really intelligent meaning still kind of dumb, but much more intelligent than most of their uh, brethren, which I think is interesting. I also dare anybody who's seen the Harry Potter movies, at least read the books, kind of iffy, but if you've seen the movies, I dare anyone to read this and not see Dobby as the uh, kind of slightly dumb goblin character who keeps trying to save people and kind of makes things worse half the time. So yeah, the Nether Scroll basically about two brothers. The main frustration for me in this book is that I think the, uh, the two brothers, their interaction was kind of what I was interested in about most. And then about a third of the way through the book or so, one of the brothers gets put under a spell and the other characters have to go and rescue him. Do a deed and in exchange, get the brother back. I kind of felt bad for, if you will, the player who was playing that brother, because they didn't have much to do, and I kind of assumed that the dumb goblin was their replacement character that they got to play. 
Yeah, sometimes I think about the uh, real-life parties playing these characters during the book. I'm sure at least some of these. I mean, we know the, the Dragonlance stuff was written in a, in a way where they tested it out, they tested their plots out with their gaming groups before they did the novels, so I'm assuming at least some of these had to be done that way. We get some more Elithids. I, you know, I can't get me enough Elithids. <laughs> Even that horrible Drizzt book that I just thought made no sense whatsoever was at least elevated a little bit because it had lots and lots of elithids. But again, going back to my earlier point, the Nether Scroll is supposed to be Lost Empire, obviously about the Netherese is kind of the empire we're looking into this time with this scroll that contains hidden ways of how they looked at magic. And it's like, I, I don't know, really the only thing we see of it is like, you know, magic is like everywhere and stuff. And it kind of feels like the one brother who reads the scroll gains a level. That's about all that happens. Like it really didn't, I mean, I don't know, maybe he enters a prestige class that came out in a, in a addendum or a compendium of some sort that was released around the same time. Maybe that's what happened, but it felt basically like he gained a level and we didn't find out anything new about the world. Again, I think Shadowstone went way more into like how magic works and how wizards see magic in this world. Not that I cared, but it did seem to delve into that more. Again, though, overall, really enjoyed this book. Uh, flew through it uh, really fast. Let's go ahead and talk about Faces of Deception, which it's frustrating because I read this book quite a while ago, right before I took my long break, and I was like, this will bring me back to it really fast because Faces of Deception, oh my god, you guys, it's really, really good. Really good. It's tons of, like, Hindu culture infused into the realms, and it has all of these complex ideas that you're forced to grapple with. The absolute sort of basic idea behind it is there's this really, really ugly guy. I don't think he's half orc. He's, just, he's like a quarter orc or something, so he's really just kind of ugly. And he becomes a follower of Saloon because he's, he's told to, like, uh, you know, or, uh, crap. Am I saying the wrong name? Saloon's the night sky, isn't it? The goddess of beauty. Doesn't matter, forgive me. As I said, been a while since I've read these. I'm not gonna bother looking up everything or else I'll be here forever. Point being, he goes to like a temple, pays a bunch of money to get a vision from the goddess herself. She tells him to go searching for this place. I can't remember the name of the place, but essentially it's Shangri-La. You know, it's this mystery place on the top of a mountain that uh, there's this little village where people have lived there forever in peace and there's no bad things and it's all beautiful and blah, 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 blah. So he and like his, I, I think he is a half-orc. I think he's like half-orc, like manservant or what have you, aide-de-camp. Go and search this place out. And essentially the first half, first two-thirds of the book is uh, more like first half, I think, is kind of an adventure story, them finding the place. What's really nice about this is they actually find the Lost Empire decently early on in the storyline, so we get a lot that takes place in this lost empire. We're hanging out there, we see how it works, we see a lot of the society and its interactions and so on and so forth. I can't even remember the name of the place, because I had never heard of it before, so I don't know if this is like anything that anybody really cared about. I mean, you know, the Netherese, you hear about them all the time, but this place I had never seen mentioned before anywhere that I could recall. So maybe that's why this dealt more with it, because Troy Denning felt more comfortable dealing with what's actually going on there rather than keeping it mysterious so that further supplements could do whatever they wanted to with the area because, you know, nobody was going to deal with this one. I love that, like, there's a character named Sanyazi. I once wrote a short story called Sanyazi. Basically, a Sanyazi is a shaman. It's a little deeper than that, but yeah, it was really fun seeing all these uh, little influences from the Bhagavad Gita, which, you know, I'm like, how rare is that to see that crossover in a realm's territory? Much like seeing Ayn An An or Ayn Rand crossed over into realm's territory, seeing the Bhagavad Gita used was really fun and interesting. It, it is also a trend through this era of realm stuff that it feels like uh, Planescape is kind of impinging on the world bit by bit by bit. Like, there's this thing that happens, I don't know, maybe a third of the way through that becomes kind of the tumbling point for all the rest of the plot that has to do with like slave traders from Sigil or, or uh, maybe not Sigil but from a different plane it felt like. I think they're Nagas. I don't know. Um, I get all those like snake people confused. I'm sure Lisa Smedman will set me straight eventually. But yeah, this comes up and, and the main antagonist is one of these snake guys from, I believe, a different plane who trails them through the entire rest of the book, like seemingly without any reason and beyond his own limits so that essentially he begins acting like the Dark One, the adversary, some sort of mythical creature. And by the end, the entire book does elevate itself to this mythical level, this level of metaphor. 
the ending of the book is not straightforward. I know a lot of people, I, I looked to see the Amazon reviews because I was really curious. I was like, what do people think of this? Because this is awesome, and I bet everybody hates it. And that's pretty much how it goes. Everybody was like, where's the sequel? What happened? Da -da 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 -da. Much like the ending of Angel, which pissed off a lot of people, I loved it because the point isn't the resolution. The point is, what does it mean for our characters at the point that we end it? And it's, it's beautiful, it's haunting. I literally, like, I'm reading the book and I'm kind of skimming because I'm like, uh, I kind of see where this is going, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then it's the end. And I was like, wait, 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 what? And, like, I had to reread the last three pages, like, four times to be like, I cannot believe he ended it there. That just made this book, like, go from, yeah, pretty good, I enjoyed it overall, to, holy shit, this is good. Oh, and the book overall is a meditation on what it means to be beautiful. And I really like that basically from the start, you know, uh, our main character is like, yeah, 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 I know, beauty comes from the inside, blah, blah, blah. I don't care, I want to look good. And I love the fact that we have essentially a fable in which the main character gets the ending of the story already and is like, no, 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 but screw that, I want the gold, you know what I mean? It's it's like it's like where if, if uh, the beginning of A Christmas Carol, Scrooge were like, you know, yeah, I get that like family's important and stuff, but... God, like, I'd rather have a warm house and then the the ghosts of Christmas, past, present, and future are, like, trying to teach him. He's like, yeah, I, I get it, but, you know, come on. Like, I can buy and sell your ass, you know? Like, I come on. Like, like I get it. It's important. and it, it, Like, it, it's not that I didn't get the lesson ever. It's just that that lesson's kind of boring, dude. This book is not going to be to everyone's taste, but I absolutely love Troy Denning for taking the risk on it, and I think he accomplished a great thing. Okay, so I kind of talked about uh, these books a little bit longer than I thought I would. So I'm going to wait and cover Prince of Lies next time. Prince of Lies I haven't read in like five years, but uh, I think I've got a lot to say on it. So we'll talk about that next time. Really glad you guys are still with me. Hope everybody's enjoying it. I know I still am overall. Yeah, hey everybody. Thanks for listening. This is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.